Great. Let's go. All right. Uh, so today I'll do my level best to work <laughs> through our um, section on on objects. Uh, the first three sections on uh, on, on objects and the the reference documentation. That's strange JavaScript error. Um, <laughs> so we're going to look at uh, look at environments. Uh, so functions relating to environments, functions relating to stacks, and functions relating to bindings of, of values to to environments. Um, I guess at the outset, I'll, I, I will freely admit that this is not an area that I know very well, or at the very <laughs> least is not an area where I've done any, I've not messed with environments, <laughs> at least <laughs> no, no, knowingly. Um, so I, I may struggle to come up with use cases here. So perhaps John, you, you, to the extent you have any, any personal experience or knowledge, feel more than free to jump in. Um, I have a small amount um, I mean, we'll talk about it as we go, but this is okay. an area of R that always, it feels like, yeah, I'll bet I could do some cool things with this. And then almost never do I actually do so with some exceptions that we can talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it feels to me like it's good to know that environments exist and this is how R manages things and that, you know, one knows about a few kind of, um, useful environments, like, uh, let's say the, uh, the global environment, um, the uh, functions environment, the caller environment, those are maybe some to know that would be useful to know about. But um, yeah, I don't know how far uh, uh, these things go. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of run through these from top to bottom. They're loosely ordered, I think, in the way in which I might have presented them in any event. Um, so we'll just go that way, see how it, how it works. I, I should note for anyone else watching um, uh, uh, that the uh, environments chapter uh, of uh, advanced R is uh, is a great reference to read <laughs> alongside the documentation because I think in many cases, uh, well, first it's worth noting the environments chapter provides a very welcome um, introduction to environments. So if you don't know them very well, um, it's worth looking at this first. Secondly, I feel like for many for many well for some functions. The exposition in the uh, advanced R environments chapter is better uh, than no. the one in Rlang in many cases simply because it exists. <laughs> um, where, whereas some functions, you know, you just see that these are parameters and it does a thing that's not explained, and then you have to look to advanced R to figure out what does this thing actually do. Like for example, yeah. in, in environment poke, uh, that one mm -hmm. that was not was not used, I think, and. Uh, unclear what it what it what it does i don't know if it's meant to be for unix people like a more aggressive version of touch, like where touch meets uh you know um cat or something like that but i i don't know um, what i'm supposed to understand from environment book absence did you before. did you read the footnote because um, he actually explains why it's named and poke in uh in the chapter Oh, I missed that. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you might wonder why Rlang has env poke instead of env set. This is for consistency. Set functions return a modified copy. Poke functions modify in place. So that's what okay. he means. So he, yeah, poke okay. is change this thing in this place, which okay. is, you know, that, that's like, that's the whole thing about environments is that you can use them like they they are mutable so when you change something it it changes uh everywhere so if that if that environment is used inside of a function and changed inside of the function it's also changed outside of the function um so that's what all that's about got it got it okay, uh, that's yeah but yeah definitely i feel like the chapter like explains the concepts whereas the documentation it assumes you know the concepts and yep. just explains the arguments. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, the chapter is very helpful here. I, I read the chapter and then uh, I actually did quickly make it through the environment um, help, but I didn't, you know, like the chapter was way more useful than the R line yeah. help in this case. Yeah. It was funny. Agree. Like I read this before, but that was like three years ago. And it was funny that I'm like, oh, okay. I like actually understood that chapter this time. <laughs> Yeah, good stuff. Um, right. Um, so let's see. 
So in the new the new environment. Um, so this is these are kind of two tools for for creating creating an an, an um an, a new environment. Uh, so env uh, creates a child of the current environment. So let's say you're you're working in the console interactively, you're, you'd create kind of a child of the global global environment. Uh, new environment allows you. It's a bit more general. It allows you to create a new environment and whose 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 parent you specify. Um, so by default, they have an interesting default here. Is that the parent is the is the empty environment. So the parent of the global environment. Um, if, if I remember correctly, it's um, actually the highest parent, but the parent in the global is whatever package you attached most recently, which uh, I just relearned okay. from the chapter. Um, <laughs> I didn't go over that part of story. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, um, but in any event, you can, you can, you know, here you can indicate which, which, which parent you, 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 you intend. Um, you actually can in env. As well, you just give one unnamed argument, and that will be the parent. Oh. So that's yeah, the dot 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 explains oh, that. I see. Here we go. It's kind of yeah. hidden in there. So really, there are two versions of the same function, just different default. And in env, you don't have to put the data inside of a list. You just you know pass named arguments to the env. Hmm. Oh God, I didn't. I didn't. Uh... I just yeah. saw. I just saw quickly. Like, okay, <laughs> these are the same thing. I didn't read further, but that's 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 a, that's a useful point, actually. Yeah, a useful point. So that's really interesting. Then um, but this does provide a little bit of the introduction to a degree, I guess. That feels like it's kind of missing in in our documentation um, about you know environments are basically objects like any others. They have some special properties. You can manipulate them. You know, provide some examples of, of uh, object-oriented programming systems within within uh, within R that kind of utilize this kind of reference semantics that you find in um, in environments. Um, yeah, um, I think that's all I took from this. Did you have anything else, more on this one, John? Just the the background that. The big thing about environments is that when you change something in, a, in an environment, anything that references that environment, exactly, like, it's the same copy. It's or it's the yeah. same. It is the same thing. It's not a copy. Versus, you know, if you send x into a function and then you change something inside of that function, your x outside of that function doesn't change. But if x is right. an environment, then it does. Like it, it, um, it's mutable which is like a whole thing. It's funny, I've been reading, or I read a book about functional programming, which R is a functional programming language. And it's all about how um, immutability, well, a big thing is about how immutability just makes your code so much like better and safer and cleaner, which is what R6 and environments let you get around <laughs> in R. <laughs> and like the, so the, the general trade-off seems to be that immutable is like easier to test and therefore can be safer, but mutable is faster slash more memory efficient because you're not making copies all the time. Right. Um, right. And so, just... yeah, that's like the big high level trade-off and environments let you do the second thing where you are, they're not copying, you're modifying in place. Um, so it can be like faster to work with environments. And then also it can do things like the main use I've seen for environments is um, you can define an environment in a package and then use that to like cache things. So, or, or um, to set global settings, or if you wanna have something that remembers the last time that this function was called, you could throw that into that environment. Huh. Um, and they do that in a fair number of the tidyverse and um, rlib packages. If you look at, I um, can't remember if they tend to put it in like the the pack the file that's named after the package, like um, package rlang or whatever, mm -hmm. or rlang package, whatever it's called, um, or in zzz or something like that. You can find something called the the because they like to refer to, or at least I think Hadley 
finds it cute that he'll do like the dollar sign, uh, you know, the cached object, the login huh. name, whatever. And so they'll have this function named V, which is in the package environment. But that means that anytime you like change change anything from another function, it's in that same place. And so uh -huh. all the functions can reference it. Um, so I've used that a little bit, but now that after I'm reading my book on functional programming, it's like, oh, but that makes functions behave differently depending on if it's like the first time you call it or the second time, yep. Yep. which can like be super confusing. Uh, so be really careful with that kind of thing. But that that's where, you know, like, let's say when you call a function, it has to look something up that cannot change, but it has to like load that thing into memory. That's where an environment of a uh, package environment can be really useful because you load that thing and now it's in memory and it everything can refer to that same thing. Um, which I think the like the there's a um, I don't think I got to them, but there are a set of functions that you can use to kind of change this value if it's not already defined with Arlang. And I will find that while you're going through the next part if I can. Sure. Um, but anyway, so that kind of thing can be useful. Um, th that's that's the general, like that's where I have seen it a lot. And then R6 is yep. all, it, you know, it's um, environments as a package as is ggproto inside of ggplot2. And then shiny is actually all R6 under the hood. So shiny, some of the mm -hmm. things that are kind of confusing about shiny are because it's working with environments and everything is modifying in place. Mm -hmm. And so that's why within Shiny, if you change something like inside of a function, it'll still, it'll be changed. Uh, you know, you think of it as like the Shiny environment, but that's why that's happening, that it's- Interesting. I'm also looking things. Uh, now for this V uh, function. Yeah. So I, I, can, I can see how people are using this in their packages. Uh, hopefully yeah, if give you me, search for- Give me some ideas. Yeah, the dollar sign would let you find things. Um, so like, or space the dollar sign. <laughs> Although I think a lot of times it'd be at the beginning of a line. So whatever. Uh, actually, it would probably never be at the very beginning of a line because it'd be inside of a function that they're calling it. So mm. um, yeah, but you could use that to find it and, or you know, look for boundaries or things like that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the, that's the, and just to make sure that it's, you know, in uh chat where someone can find it so um yeah i can't think of an example um i think maybe in httr2 they might do some some of the like caching of tokens okay with the um and then i, I don't know there are it's possible that some of the stuff where they do um where they have data sets and packages that they might secretly be using something like the, so that it loads once you use it. I mean, that's, there are functions that we're gonna talk about that do some of that. But. Right. Yeah, this, anyway. this idea that you just mentioned of like storing tokens, that's that's kind of an interesting idea. Cause I, I know for one package I, I, I made that's interacting with an, with an API. Um, yeah, I kind of have in lots of settings, just like lo load, loading, loading, the, loading something from an environment variable. Um, uh, and then like setting setting that off, but uh, might be interesting to store it in um, an environment. Anyway, just to <laughs> maybe maybe more memo for my future self. Um, yeah, uh, I don't have like I need to go back and look at. I have a a place or two where I use the that I feel like it might actually be a bad idea. <laughs> and now that I've learned <laughs> more, and so I want to um, dig in and make sure that it's not going to be confusing because you don't want to do things that. Basically, if something is magical, it has to always be good. <laughs> like, and you want to make sure that you aren't just making it hard for someone to figure out, wait, why did this work yesterday and it doesn't work today? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, anyway. Cool. Um, let's see. So we've got uh, environment prints, which uh, is kind of a nice little convenience function. So in environment, if you print out an environment in the console in with Betasar, it just shows the memory address, which is not terribly helpful. Uh, with environment prints, okay, this is one of those cases actually where the uh, advanced R chapter um, 
provides a nice overview. Uh, here we go. Ah, so it looks something like like this. So you, you would still get the uh, the memory address, but then you'd also um, kind of understand what it's, it prints out for the parents, and then any kind of bindings, any values, uh, mm -hmm. name values that are kind of bound to that that environment uh, that are printed out in this mm -hmm. in this fashion. So it's kind of useful if you want to understand what what environment you know is, what it contains, um, who its parent is. Um, so it's to my lab, to my mind, like kind of a, just a nice convenience function uh, in dealing interactively mm -hmm. with, with with environments. You can extract some of these properties with other functions that we'll come to see, but this is just a nice way to see uh, see what's going on. Also, uh, I forgot this until quickly scanning the, the documentation now. That if if your environments are sort of a little bit complex entities where um, you're kind of uh, Late, like lazy loading some objects, uh, then then it'll kind of indicate that that's the case. So you'll you'll see that these bindings exist, but they may not you know have have any have any value as as yet. So they've not been they've not been like touched touched by a function, and so uh, they're kind of like promises, I, I guess that that exist that um, haven't been populated yet. At least that's kind of my loose, loose yeah. understanding of the thing. Yeah, so and then the have, other thing, complex environments, it, it gives you a little clear view. Go ahead, John. And just the other thing was reading the chapter, I was like, oh, but, um, you know, if it's listing all the bindings, that could get messy. Well, okay, they have it built in that it lists up to 20 bindings. So uh -huh. and I assume oh, I like, catch that. like okay, tipple, yeah. yeah, I assume it'd be like tipple where it says and more, you know, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I like, I like that they take a lot of, or put a lot of thought into the printing step. Um, because it is, I don't know, it can be annoying and I, I forget that this exists. And sometimes those rare times when I am doing something with environments, I'm trying to wrap my head around what is happening in them. Looking inside them can be a pain, Yeah. but there it doesn't have to be. M print just fixes that, so. Yeah, yeah, for me, I think the pain point is figuring out, so sort of finding the base art function that helps me inspect something and then actually understanding the documentation because the documentation uh, I don't know comes in a different form than tidyverse documentation I often find hard to understand I think until I read the the um, advanced art book I, I had really no clue as to what tricatch did um, or I had a I feel like I had to perennially go back and read it and reconvince myself like kind of try to re-understand what the thing did uh, so I, I find like base art documentation a little, mm. little difficult to 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 uh, understand. Yeah, uh, thanks to this club, I have fully converted to using TriFetch, uh, which oh, is the yeah. R-Lang version, just exactly. because it has prettier documentation. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's all, and so, and, well, and like usual, you know, the, the order of the arguments is clear, yeah. the, all that kind of thing. Um, and so I have tried, I'm trying to get better about it, that if I'm hitting something that I don't have control over, I try to be consistent of wrapping that. And there's any chance that it'll be weird. Then I yeah. try to be consistent and wrap it, wrap it and try fetch and deal with. If there's, and I guess the other if on that is if the error message won't be like better than what I could do, which in a lot of cases, yeah, just let the basic, whatever the error is happen. But I have some stuff um, that hits APIs that yeah. sometimes the APIs are just weird. Uh, I have one where, um, like, after you refresh your token, it takes a little bit. And so oh. I have some, some other stuff, and it's variable how long it takes. And so I have other things that are kind of like, oh, um, you know, check that it didn't uh, fail in the way that indicates that it probably just hasn't finished refreshing yet. Right. Um, or, or or with some developers, they don't they don't like increment the API version, and so they just kind of have a change in place. And so your 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 code is expecting something from an from an endpoint, right. and you get something different, right? Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I've been trying, especially I'm wrapping up a project, a work project, and as I am leaving, I'm trying to like future proof some things. Um, and one of the things is wrap everything in try fetch if it's hitting a package that could potentially change its API so yeah. that it doesn't just suddenly break and not like it'll still break, but now it'll tell them exactly why and where in the code 
they yeah. can fix that. Um, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. But coming back to this printing, printing is, 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 uh, is, is very important. Like, I completely agree with you. These, these are nice little convenience functions, particularly for people that are learning stuff, I think. Um, yeah, it, it actually has me wondering if you could, um, if you defined, like, could you define uh, print dot environment in your uh, working environment to call and print instead? Huh. I wonder. I might have to play with that. Like, I worry it's it's such a basic thing. Would it break some some fundamental things to do that? Because a lot of times mm -hmm. they'll have ways for you to do that through an option or something, All right. and they they don't hear. And it makes me wonder. Um, I might have to play with that. Yeah, definitely report back. I'm I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious on that one. Um, you, you may have just uttered an idea that that could be in a future version of of our studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so let's see. Uh, these, so th this kind of family of functions are, are are aimed at kind of getting it, getting environments, and each one of them kind of gets a different set of environments. So environments may be, um, may have ancestors, or may have parents, and um, so the environment parent gets the immediate um, parent, uh, unless you change the the value of n. So by default, it just gets the immediate the immediate parent. Um, environment parents gives a list of all parents all the way back to the empty environment, if I remember correctly. Um, and then um, environment tail um, gives the environment, you know, kind of this, this, this ancestral line, the last, the last environment that, uh, that's, uh, that, that exists before you hit the empty environment. Um, so in this way, you can kind of, understand like your your environment trace stack in a certain sense you, you can kind of see what what what, what environments um, um yeah sorry I, I lost my train of thought there but uh, <laughs> um did you have anything on this one john or any, any actual use cases of this i, I thought it was interesting you know uh, in, in in advanced star i kind of showed showed some things that were very compactly that were really nice but i i don't know if i would see myself using this in practice, but that's probably true of almost everything that we'll go over today, <laughs> at least not yet. I don't like, I have a, a actually a thing I'm actively working on where I have a really nasty hack that I'm hoping to get rid of soon, where just to make error messaging prettier, I, um, I'm it's with S7, uh, the new object system mm -hmm. and you have like you define them with um for example a a validator which is a function that is inside right like it's in the definition and so it's it's a few yeah. levels deep and getting the error messaging to know where you called it from is kind of tricky uh -oh. so i don't use like i could use and parent i'm um i'm actually using caller and with an end yep. argument, which is the same as in parent effectively, because color env yep. can take an argument of how far back to go. Um, but I have to go back in this case, it's three steps. And it's just, it's, I hate it of like, I don't really need the caller and I don't need the caller of the caller, et cetera. I have to go back three instead of one um, hmm. all the time. And it's a really hacky call, but it's there. Like it is the thing that I am using in order to kind of escape from this deep nested function to say, yeah, but this is where the, the user actually called this from. Feels so like that that's they something don't... that should exist yeah. in S7, you know? Uh, do, do you know if there's I... like any like PRs or any plans for, for that? Um, I agree. And I am, uh, there's a discussion. So <laughs> okay. I, I, I am trying to get to the point, number one, where I uh, understand things. Like I'm at the point right now where I don't know if the error is because I don't get something mm -hmm. or... yeah you know, or because it's not there. And so I'm yeah, getting yeah. past that first piece. And if so, then um, there is a, a PR or a, a um, issue about something with validation um, that is related, but it's, I don't think it's exactly there. Basically they wrote it in, you know, 
to be part of Basar. And so working with it right after we did all the stuff with conditions, and I've just gotten in the habit of writing really good, I think, really good error messages that do proper passing yep. of the calls and you know all the all the stuff that we learned about. And I start writing it in S7 and you can't do any of that because mm -hmm. they don't use Arlang and they don't use CLI, you know, they use base error messaging. Um and I'm like, but I want to do it right. I want pretty errors. I want them to reference the name of the variable that you're setting and you know whatever. Maybe, maybe that's like that. that should be a future function for for our lang, right? I mean, it seems, yeah, it sounds like, or, yeah, given what the intents are for S7, you know, that it's going to be mainlined into, you know, our like base R, then you know, having this function exist, it needs to exist somewhere that's in the package. But they really, really need, or it would be really nice if they let you pass uh, the like um, caller environment and argument names, those sorts of things through to the validator or the setter or the different functions that you define as part of the class, those functions are validated and they say, oh no, it can only have these arguments. And I'm like, yeah, but I want to pass the caller through, you know, caller environment, things like that. Um, and so I, that is what I'm hoping is that we can get them to open up well, so so far, it feels like it'd be nice if they had these arguments like all the CLI functions have that mm -hmm. default to uh you know default to the color environment, but you can set them if in in the case where you're calling something from a function yeah. and want to pass that down, things like that. So um I'm hoping they'll set it up so that you could eventually use our lang to make it pretty because you know. Arlang doesn't do, I think in a few places, they do things through C that you can't do really in base R, but all this environment stuff is just prettier packaging on stuff that you can do in base R. So I would like to see that um, easier. Now, in theory, like I could do something crazy where like I reference a variable in the caller environment, um, and then use that to pass through the, uh, you know, to pass the call down the chain. Um, but that feels super hacky. <laughs> so I'm trying to avoid that. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's uh, that's a place where I am dealing with this kind of thing. Now, env parents, um, that just totally feels like something you use interactively to expect, inspect yep. things. Yep. And, and Somewhat similar env tail, like it's just it feels like it's too, um, I don't know, like let's just look over there versus env parent. Even if it's with a number, you know, you're you're stepping up, you're going through a stack in a way that feels a lot more logical than the other two to use programmatically. Now that said, I haven't searched. Maybe they use it somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, other than kind of like pedagogical this... tools to me. But... Yeah. Um, so yeah. Now I I need to go do the GitHub search and see if I can find <laughs> calls to end parent first within our lib. Is it all in our lang? Uh, or not end parent? End parent I can understand. End tail. End tail is all 100% inside of our lang. Hmm. As far as our lib, let's see. If we go to strip first, go up to tidyverse, nothing. And if we just get rid of the org. Um, uh, now I'd have to do a more complex search because it's finding um, other languages. Although oh, hmm. there's our yeah oh um grade this in from our studio the the okay um, package for grading things uses env tail um and then it's all just like copies of our lang oh i'll have to talk to yanni because uh yanni cd has something that is using env tail i wonder if that's huh i'll have to look at that 
so yeah there are but it's funny like there's someone's uh oh, that's lionel of the uh, our lib team has an arlang labs <laughs> um huh. uh repo where i'm guessing this is where he's like uh yeah, a package to experiment with Arlang extensions. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not. It's mostly just like clones of Arlang mention and tail. Um, kind of confirms our suspicions. Uh, yeah, to a degree. Had actually very much like so many clones. Um, but every once in a while, someone is doing something where they are playing with it. It looks like, but yep. largely exploratory. It looks like. So, one that's kind of related to this one is a uh, in in depth. Uh, so it simply kind of tells you the number the number of environments and separates the kind of the the environment you pass through the function as as the end um, uh, argument uh, between it and the the uh, and the empty environment. Um, not really sure how we'd use that, but anyway. Um, so this is coming back to poke. Um, yeah. So these these are kind of for setting uh, setting a, an environment, um, and uh, th this this one's kind of so we got get env set env and env poke parent. Um, so get env was actually kind of I think it's very is useful saying this is a Again, a case like where, um, if um, oh wait, sorry, am I misremembering this? <laughs> okay, I guess I am misremembering this. Okay, never mind. I was, I was remembering yeah. something different. Um, Actually, I'm trying to remember now. Set environment. So it's the um, like environment. <laughs> I'm not. I thought I understood what okay. this was, and now I'm not so sure. Yeah. So it says env is an environment, but env is often like an object that you want to know where it is. So you can call get env on something, and then it returns the environment that that thing is from. Belongs to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, That's what threw me for, for a loop, because it, yeah, this... Okay, because mm -hmm. here in the examples, they're they're kind of looking at you know taking a function or a closure and then and then getting the environment to which it um, that thing belongs or where that thing is defined, where it's bound. Yeah, I wonder why env. Huh. Yeah, it feels like it should be like x, not env. Yeah, um, that's a weird one. Um, <laughs> right, so let's see. Yeah, so just examples here of, of getting of getting the um, getting the environments and okay, so. Yeah, this this is I guess one one interesting case. So you're with with set environment. Um, you, I think this is here here where it's starting to talk about the side of, side effects. So it doesn't create a side effect. So you've got so you set some environment, um, and then you you set the function in a particular in a particular environment. Um, Yeah. Okay, so, but it, is, it, but, is it equal to, equal to the environment? But it's. Um... Or sorry, go ahead, John. Well, just that um, you know, notice that you assign the result of set env to something. You aren't like it's 
it, you're yep. not, it's not, it's not the thing. It's, it's, it becomes <laughs> a different thing. Yeah. So you're not, you're not setting the environment of the thing you pass in. You're creating a copy of the thing you pass in, except that copy has the environment that you set for it. Um, which is, this is right. where that, that semantic thing that the footnote comes in. It's called set env, which means it returns a copy versus get and or I mean, poke env would return or would modify in place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here they kind of, yeah, refer to the side effects. Yeah. yeah. So, so this this is going to be this is a, this is a, a a different this is, becomes a different thing when you when you set the environment of the thing. Yep. Yeah, it's you don't actually when you call set and env, you're not updating fn, you're creating a yep. copy. A copy. So, yep. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, and this is a case. So I think the poke. Poke parents. Yeah. Poke parent is where you would be doing magic that would be confusing and surprising, where you're forcing something in R to modify a in place. Yep. Because that's that's the secret that I'm realizing as you think about it. You're always working in an environment in R, like whether it's the global environment or a package environment or whatever. So um Environments can modify in place, so you can modify in place in R uh, by changing that object in the environment that you are calling or that you're trying to change. And that's what envpoke parent is about. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to change this definition. Really, all you're doing is overwriting the object. Um, but in some cases, depending on what it is, like those objects actually change in the same spot in memory. So it's, it's weird and confusing, but that's what M poke parent is about, is to do the modify in place. Did that make any sense? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think that makes sense. So so in this case here, the new M would simply be the, the environment itself, right? Um, yeah, and the, you don't need to assign the result of an parent to anything because it's actually changing ah, okay. the environment. Got it. Got it. Yeah, let me see. This is one that no longer exists. The what? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. This still exists. This is uh, now coming to the bindings. Okay, so uh, this is the end, end of poke. It's not poke parent, yeah. but it's poke. Okay, um, <laughs> perfect. Um, and as I thought might happen, this stuff is complicated, so we probably aren't <laughs> going to get all the way through it's, today. And that's all good. Um, right. Um, so this this does what it says and doesn't really require too much further explanation. So inf clone is you're creating a new environment that is a clone of your kind of source and environment. So it has the same same bindings um, uh, as as the current environment um, or well your source environment. Um, coalesce is kind of interesting. I guess the coalesce hopefully will probably. Is it, is it dplyr that has coalesce or is it tidy r? I forget which. It's dplyr. Dplyr, okay. Yeah. Um, so in the, in this case, like let, let's say you have two environments and they each have their own sets of bindings and you sort of want to have the combination of the two. And so with, with coalesce, you can um, uh, you know have some environment that whose bindings you want to change and then the environment from which you're going to copy uh, other, other bindings. Uh, the example is pretty helpful. Um, let's see, where does the example start here? <laughs> okay, here we are. So uh, let's say we have um, you know, two environments. Uh, they, they're talking here about the left-hand side, right-hand side. Um, so we'll, we have this environment, left-hand side, where A equals one. Right hand side where uh, A equals A, B equals B, C equals C, the character versions of that. Mm -hmm. 
And then we can do inv coalesce. So we'll take the left-hand side um, and then we will um, basically take these bindings and apply them, uh, or sorry, we'll take the right-hand side. This is the, the environment from which we'll take some bindings. We take those non-existing bindings and then we bring them to bring them to the left-hand side. So if you print out left-hand side, you'll see here we've got B and C, which are characters, but uh, A is 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 a is a double here. So since A is already bound to something, um, this coalescing won't won't like supplant uh, the binding of A with the the binding that exists and the uh, or sorry, <laughs> yeah, this binding won't supplant this binding. Yeah. In the I like that side. the the. I like that they go to the tip of here's how to do the whole thing. If you actually want to overwrite, yep. you yep. unbind, you can use end yep. names. You, you know, we've got this whole collection of functions. There you go. Exactly. Which I think we'll come to in a bit. Um, <laughs> may, maybe, should, should time allow. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, whoops. Uh, this is a pretty quick one. Uh, in yeah. Inherits all this is also a quick one where I found myself confused. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I mean, basically, it's going to return a boolean about whether 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 it has has an answer. Whether okay, never mind. This returns true if X has ancestor among its parents. Oh, okay. Um, okay, okay, never mind. Uh, now, <laughs> now, now, now I'm now I'm straight. Uh, so, so, so this one. X uh, instead of M. Anyway, that's a small issue. Oh, um, yeah. It, it is actually interesting. I want to do a round of um, fixes on the documentation because mm -hmm. I, I saw several places where they had typos because oh, interesting. Um, they're probably the only people who have ever read these docs. <laughs> <laughs> Until now. <laughs> In a lot of cases. Well, not, I'm not, not exclusively, but you know, environments are an advanced topic. A lot of the people yeah. who are working with environments may have been working with environments since before our line existed. Yeah. And so they just use the base versions of these. And so we are learning this stuff and reading it. And oh, there's this, the left-hand side, right-hand side in the last one in Coalesce, like the yep. wording was off in the help. And so I wanted to fix that because it does what I think That's it does, point. but it doesn't say what I think it does. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, like I'm like oh I guess you could interpret that to mean what it does but it's not yeah. clear so anyway yeah. Uh, yeah so basically you're checking if a, if a particular environment is among the ancestors uh, of of uh, uh, of of your the environment that you're looking at so um... I, I I do think I think X is right the function's wrong the documentation is right like it should be X there because you're saying yeah. well I'll have to check. Can and well, whether whether it's an object can it be or anything? It's an environment. Hmm. Yeah. Now I am curious. Uh, um, go ahead or go on, and I'm going to try to get this sorted out. Um, nope, and must be an environment. So. You do have to pass it. So okay. you would have to get the environment of a, the object and then pass that okay. through to see if it inherits. Fair enough. Um, uh, right. So this distinction is kind of one we saw previously where we're looking at what the predicate functionals. Um, so is, is, is an object an environment? So that's kind of a first thing. So X in this case is uh, some object that may be an environment, may not be. You're testing whether it is. Uh, and then is bare environment, does the, so is it an environment and does it furthermore not contain the S3 or S4 classes? Um, wonder if those will get extended in future too. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, that's interesting because I'll bet it, no, I think it's, it, uh, It'll still work because S seven objects have S three classes and S four classes. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So, <laughs> wonder if this applies to R six objects. Yeah, uh, th I think that is specifically one of the examples that it is for. That an R six object is a an environment with an S three class. Okay. Um. 
go back and look at that, that stuff. <laughs> um, right. Okay, Co coerce into an environment. Here you can pass in as X either a list or a vector, a, a named list or named vector, um, and then indicate its parent. Um, by default, it's it's kind of funny that here parent equals null, whereas it says by you know by default empty environment, and this is indeed a function empty environment. I don't know why. Uh, when I was looking at this earlier, I, I anyway. Yeah, their defaults or what their defaults are, I guess. But you see caller env and all kinds of other functions that resolve to an environment. But anyway, um, it's, 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 I guess, a minor thing. It might, I wonder if it's um, like a dispatch thing that they can dispatch a special version. No, because it's the second argument. I don't know. I don't know if they're doing anything tricky there that having null instead of a call to a function makes it like faster or cleaner or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this one is interesting. Uh, just the, I, I actually, I think you can do it with base if you send a list into um, just environment, it'll create an environment that is yes, that list. I, I think that's right. I think so I that's, did that once before, yeah. Um, I mean, this is basically new environment. It's just, it takes different- mm, That's a good point. Things. But uh, that's interesting. I wonder if it is new environment, just with maybe some checks, uh, some, or vice versa, I guess. Um, list to env. Let's see, and then it gets down to it's calling C eventually. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, but it seems like it's basically the same thing. I wonder if it's just a different way of getting there or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's new... maybe a convenience function to coerce from something you have, right? Rather than... Yeah. Um, and, and it's a bit more permissive in terms of what X can be. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, like, they, if you look at the code, they do it, they do what they do in completely different ways, even though they're doing basically the same thing. Um, that is not the code that I just saw. What? Oh, I see. It's just coil or condensed in the when I have F2 into it. OK, but yeah, so it's um. You know, it's doing this this call to Vec as environment, blah blah blah, versus new environment is like it gets to base right away. Uh, dude, new environment uh, gets no no uh, new here type do this new Oops. you do that search oh, with okay. the with the arrow. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, <laughs> Oops, if you type quick. There, there um, it is. Um, uh, it's not quite there yet. You have to get to, because you're in, um, there we go. But yeah, look, so like, it's doing new.m oh, so right base. away, and then it's checking the data, and then it's doing binding of that data into that environment. That it created. Mm -hmm. It's just it's a completely different implementation that I think comes out to the same thing, and that's just <laughs> weird. Weird. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, I'll dispense with the easy ones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is, is, it, is it user facing? So this is kind of a test of environment. So if, I guess if you had an environment, you can test whether it's user facing. So the user facing, I think, is uh, basically one that the user could 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 access. So it'd be one of one of these these two like global environments. Um, and, and yeah, one that it like is package, being accessed. Yeah, it's one that is being accessed by the user. Is what they're yeah. like. Yeah, at. either loaded a package yeah. or the global environment, but not the yeah. environment of a package, which could be kind of like generated by a package behind the scenes. So that wouldn't be yeah. user. Yeah. 
Um, um, something that was interesting in that one, just real quick, oh, is yeah. if you look at the examples, they're broken because they huh. only work interactively because it's saying, is it user facing? And so like, it doesn't, uh, yeah. it doesn't work if you call it from the documentation. It doesn't actually do what they want it to do. Um, huh. And I tried even running it like interactively in our studio where you say run examples and it does these same errors there. But if you copy and paste into your session, it works fine. So anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, browse environments. Should I even look at this one? Um, yeah, this is something that was interesting. And I, I, I was kind of thinking about the other day, like what, what is how would this work in practice? I think I simply need to use it. So it, it, it kind of the, the pitch is that it is to um, it is to environments what browser is to functions, I guess. Um, so you yeah. somehow like step through environments. How you do this in practice, I'm not quite sure. And then what more you gain, I'm also not quite sure. Because if, if you're running browser, let's say in a function, you could you can inspect like informally, I guess, the environment there. Just, interactively so I, I i don't know i was i was left wondering my guess how, how to use this so one guess would be that you could um like set some package environment to be browsed and then call some other function and when it hits that package environment it would tell you basically uh, okay I think so. That's that's um, that's, an, that's another one. Uh, that's the is browse part. Yeah. So the is browse tells you is it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it being browsed? You know, have you turned this thing on? Because you turn it on and then off when you're done with it. It's kind of like debug once or debug on a normal function that you can call debug on a function and then it will go into the browser whenever that function is called. And this is whenever an environment is used it'll go into browse mode and then you can see what the values of different um you know uh different variables are at the moment that you call it things like that it's you know it is purely for debugging and I, i'm trying to think there might be cases in some of those cases where i've messed with uh package environments this could potentially be useful hmm. for the same kind of idea so okay well, i guess i'm seeing a little bit the utility of it. Um, yeah. And is browsed, I feel like, is another one of those that they wrote for themselves so they could write a yeah. test for something, you know? And yeah, then they're like, well, exactly. might as well give it to other people. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then I guess last one of this section, which is slightly over time here, um, is, 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 is kind of these things which allows you to kind of fetch properties from from different things. So uh, you've kind of got the color, the current, uh, the color, and then the frame. Uh, so the current, the current the properties of things in the current environment, properties of things, you know, access or function for things that are in the color environment. And then for the frame, I believe that you can pass in the, the, the frame. So I guess the frame would be I was re rapidly kind of scanning the, the, the this part of the um, advanced R chapter here, but you know, my understanding is basically as as the let's say as some code um, as a, as a different call gets executed, like has it has a, it has a context in which it's getting executed. If I kind of put it that way, and so you can seize onto those those. So that would be the frame, and then you could kind of access things from those frames within like the call, the call stack or the call list. That's what I think I understand. Um, so let's see, ba, 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 ba. call stacks, oh, nice little lobster example here. So um, I could be completely wrong on this, but um, each one of these would be, I think, a frame in a certain sense. So you've got these nested, these nested calls. So F calls G, G in turn calls H, and then H does something. Uh, and so if you're looking at the kind of the call, the call tree, it would look a little bit something like this. And each like slice of this would be a frame, loosely speaking. Yeah, I just um, uh, 
I just rechecked that it, uh, the frame is the environment, the call oh, that was used this? to get to that environment. Yeah, so it's the expression that was used uh, to get there, then the environment where it is happening, okay. and the parent, which is where it was called from. from. Okay. So it's not the parent of the environment, it's the parent of, like, it, where the, what caused you to get here? Yeah. Which yeah. same, you know, like. What, 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 it's, what called the expression, yeah. Yeah, so it's a type of, mostly a type of environment, but it's a way of, like, framing <laughs> um looking at environments that yeah. you could be you could get to the same environment but it would be a different frame because you got there in a different way right so that's what's going on there and just i want to point out um if you have a minute we have sure. now done the stack section because the stack section is just this that we're looking at right now and then environment bindings i think largely oh, so it is. we can just okay. do without going into Sure. The documents, because it, most of them are what they say. <laughs> um, so just to, yeah. uh, to wrap up here, let me make sure I'm looking at the same screen. The one thing is they've got the weird squiggly arrow. Um, that is env bind lazy. And so it's saying assign this thing to X or this thing to whatever name I give it, but don't actually evaluate it yet. Don't Don't do the work until I use it. So that's an interesting little thing that I might, I don't know, I'll have to look into whether there are places where that would be useful in some of my code. Um, and that's, so envbind lazy is assign this thing, but don't do the work to create it. So if I'm calling functions, um, they have the example where they just sleep for a second so, and then assign it. So they, they say assign to this thing, sleep for a second and then do the thing. And you can see that the first time you call it, it sleeps for a second. The second time you call it, it immediately uh, has that value because that value has been loaded into memory. That's all that is. And then active bindings are um, objects that change, like uh, uh, they're kind of like mini environments. They're, you know, you say X gets this value and then you pass X into a function. If it changes inside of that function and it's an active binding, it changes, like it updates everywhere. Yeah. Um, Let's see, and unbind is just, you know, we saw that, get rid of things. Yeah. And poke is, uh, it's set a thing inside of an environment. Um, and, it, you know, set it everywhere that that environment is used. Mcache, actually load that one, because that's the one I was trying to think of. Yeah. Um, this is what you're talking this, about within packages. Uh... Yeah. So it does mget and end poke. It's, if you have the thing already, in that environment, it just loads it. If it's not in that environment, it sets it. Oh. Um, that's all. Like it's, okay. uh, but that's the thing that I have used in a couple of places where the first time or whenever I'm loading the thing, I only want to generate it the first time that I load it. So, yep. um, cool. or but I might also like you know in other cases you say okay, but I want to override the cache, and so I'll do an end poke at that point or whatever. Um, local bindings and with bindings, I assume are like with our style. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah. Um. So yeah, when you're I'll done, temporarily you change it back. Bindings, yeah. Okay. So that's cool. Um. And uh, this has... is the one I was thinking of. Is uh, if or no wait, uh, maybe. It was this was this in the this is the one I was so, thinking of earlier. It's like if the binding doesn't exist, it'll it'll return it'll error. Is that right? Whereas uh, with base R, if the binding doesn't exist, it'll return null. Not so. Right. env has yeah. is just returning true or false. Okay, okay, that's right. But so and this is the next one is what was causing confusion. So yeah, env has is hey because does this thing have this uh, env binding? Get, there we are. Env right. get versus get env. Get env, yeah. Yeah, so get env gets the environment, env get gets a thing from an environment. Um, and that's the one where in base it'll return null, in with rlang it'll error if the thing doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and then env names and env length do what they say. Basically it treats the environment like a list and does what you would think a list would do. So it'll say, what are the names of all the things 
in the environment and what are and how many things are bound in that environment. Awesome. And that's it. That's all all the environment stuff. The stuff is uh crazy. Like I, I have been actively I'm working on kind of a part of a project that is a package that's a data type, basically. Huh. And I keep going in circles of what do I want this thing to be? Should it be an R6? Should it be an S7? Should it just be S3? Should it just be like lists? Um, and I am currently settling on S7, I think, because the object is important for itself. And then you would use it in functions versus an R6 is an object that um, kind of does things. It comes along with functions to do things to it. And... Yeah you want to be able to update in place. So if it's like changing a lot and needs to be fast, then R6 would be better. But the thing I'm making, it's you create this data structure from a different data structure once, and then you'll use it for a bunch of things. And so hmm. um, S7 makes more sense for that, I think. Uh, but yeah, um, environments came in. It was, it was funny because I was like, oh, maybe I should make an environment. And then you know, and use that. And then you can have, you know, change as you copy things and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I just reinvented R6. Um, Maybe you call it R5, my, uh, R6 minus one. So like minus, minus methods. Uh, to, to yeah. With it. Well, and that was the fun thing of um, uh, Torch has, you know, Torch, the R package Torch mm -hmm. has S7s which are, or sorry, R7s, which are R6s, plus he did some stuff for <laughs> um, working with them on uh, disk and on GPU and things like in ways that matter for Torch. Got and it. so they already had R7 inside of Torch and then they named S7 R7 originally and it was very confusing. But I stumbled on R7 before all of the conference talks and stuff because I was trying to understand something better in Torch and did a search and found this R7 package and then finally realized, oh, this has nothing to do with Torch. Um, so anyway, cool. yeah, environments, they're crazy and they feel like they'll be really useful. And then usually any code that I write that has environments, I end up going, no, this is just confusing. Um, I should simplify this. So I am anxious to see. I, the, I, I do, I think we should like put it, I'll try to put a thing in the, um, in the chat with a search for the, so we can see how they <laughs> have used package environments. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting, I don't know, it's an interesting idea. I haven't thought much beyond that one, but it, it, it sounds interesting. I'll, I'll just have a look. Yeah. John, on a completely separate matter, do you, do you know if the conference talks or, or like the, the, the agenda is available for PositConf? Um, it is if you are registered. Yeah, so I registered for online, um, but uh, yeah. okay. I'll, I'll, I'm I'll... going to leave this out of the video, so I'm going to say okay. stop.